It's not entirely right to say that logic is faulty. Logic is the way it's supposed to be. It's, it is the only way it can be. But it just so happens that there is an error in a manner of speaking in logic that we can't see. David Bohm talks about the systematic error, which is to say that there's an error in our very viewpoint, so that no matter what we view, no matter where we look, we won't see the error because it's in our way of looking. So this is really important for us to know because what it means is that if we try to navigate our way using thought under the impression that there is no systematic error in thought, we will run into problems every time and we won't be able to see those problems for what they are. We'll be seeing the fault in the wrong place. And the, the fault in logic, if we can continue to call it that, is essentially that logic always contains the two terms, positive and minus. And everything we do activates the minus. So anything positive we do activates the minus. And the thing about having a positive and a minus, it's a bit like a piston cycle in, in a regular old fashioned car engine. So if we could imagine that um, in this sense that thinking mine is a bit like a piston engine. So when one piston fires, um, the movement is from one end of the piston to the other. So we could call that a positive movement. But that positive movement can only take place if there's a corresponding negative movement in another piston. So when the hot gas is expanding in the one piston, the previously hot gas is contracting and creating negative pressure in the next. So the two work together. You could never have an engine that just has a positive stroke in it, a positive movement. The car would lurch forward by an inch and then it would stop forever. So that's probably not the, the, the very best way of explaining polarity, but it's um, kind of a way of explaining it at any rate. What it comes down to is that we can't free ourselves on purpose. So that's a simpler way of putting it. If only we could understand this. We cannot free ourselves on purpose because on purpose means that we're guided by thought. Thought is a manifestation of logic. It's logic translated into the physical world. And all logic is based on a polarity. So when we are based on a polarity, the inevitable assumption we're making is that everything is contained within the two poles of north and south or positive and minus. So in other words, we've got a framework and every single thing that there is, so we assume, can be precisely defined or located in terms of the axes of that framework. Which means that we've developed a very big blind spot. We've developed a, a blind spot when we utilize thought because we can no longer see anything that doesn't fit on the framework, that can't be located or defined in terms of the framework. As far as the framework is concerned, everything else apart from its own remit doesn't exist because the framework is now our criterion for working out what exists. And that's significant because the world that is assumed by the framework, which is the remit of the framework, which is really an extension or projection of that framework, is a closed world. It seems not to be closed because we can walk and walk around it 
kind of like walking around the inside of a sphere, if you can imagine that. And it doesn't seem as if we're running into any limits. That we, we, we are operated upon by an invisible limit, even if we can't see it. And that invisible limit is the closure of the system. Either system doesn't reach out and connect with reality, it curves back and reconnects with itself. Now, if only we could understand that about thought, we'd understand why we can never use thought to become free. A naive way of understanding how thought would allow us to become free is that it would create some kind of positive movement that would boost us like a, like a space rocket out of the gravitational pull of our situation and take us up into the stratosphere, out into zero gravity and we'd be We'd be out there, we'd be free. But that doesn't get to happen in a closed system because a closed system is made up equally of positive and minus, just as a framework is made up equally of the, the axis that above zero and the axis below zero. They're both mirror images of each other. And so what that means is when we think we're moving in a straight line, we're taking off, we've got this linear um, momentum, this feeling of, of being on the runway and going faster and faster, which is a euphoria producing feeling because we, we feel as if we're breaking free, we feel as if we're going somewhere. If only we were, there's an actual fact that positive movement connects up with itself and again. And if, again, and if we think in terms of the inside of a three-dimensional sphere, we can see Yes, of course, any direction we're going is going to link us up with where we started off from. And the framework space, which is the remit of the framework, is a closed world. It is, um, it does loop back on itself. It's a looping world. And so, Although we have the perception that we're going somewhere, the whole time we think we're going somewhere, we're being invisibly acted upon by the limitation, which is the closure of the system, which means that we're basically never going anywhere because we can't have plus without minus. So to go around in circles is not to be free. We're going around in circles and in the first instance, we, we are experiencing the, the excitement of thinking we're going to be free, which is equivalent to the euphoric phase of our activities. And in the, the second instance, there's a letdown. So, which comes without us realizing it. We think we're getting somewhere and we find out that we're not, and that's the negative phase, the dysphoric phase. So we can only gain stuff to the stuff, the same extent that we lose it. And we can manage to wangle something out of this system. We can manage to wangle this nice, lovely feeling that we're getting somewhere, but we have to pay for it within the terms of the system, which is like this pure accounting. We have to pay for it in terms of an equal and opposite dissatisfaction as things move on. Now this is a an outrageous um, situation. There's no reality in it. There's just a type of false feeling good that comes from deceiving ourselves, that comes from not seeing the whole picture, which we don't see anyway. We can't see when we're in a closed system because a closed system doesn't represent itself to itself as a closed system. It acts as if it's a perfectly open system. In other words, a closed system acts like the whole of everything. As far as we're concerned, it is the whole of everything. And that's why we don't feel trapped, and that's why we feel like our horizons are um, open. So what we're talking about here is a type of containment with, within a situation that isn't ever going anywhere or which isn't ever changing. And what this tells us is that the situation we're caught in isn't real because we can say that the, the, um, the essential quality of being in the real world is that we can get somewhere 
and that there is freedom in it and it's not all just a loop. So we're making the kind of, um, we're taking it as a, as a kind of basic proposition that reality is open-ended, the world created by our thoughts is closed without admitting that it's closed. Because if a closed world um, admitted or represented itself or had some information in it relating to the fact that it's a closed system, it would actually be open because that information would allow us to get beyond the system and see that it's closed. So a closed system can absolutely in no way ever have any acknowledgement within itself that it is closed. So what all this basically comes down to is that if we are operating on the system of thought on the basis of our thinking, we'll go round and round in circles forever. And just as long as we're only looking a little bit far ahead of our noses, we'll be experiencing um, the feeling of progress, the feeling that this is whatever we're doing is actually working for us. But we have to keep it very, very short-sighted. We can never step back and look at what's really going on. So we can be continually excited that we're going to get somewhere. That'll be interspersed with periods of despair and con of a conviction that we're not getting anywhere. So it can be seen that this is our normal consciousness. It, it's a it's a mixture of euphoria and dysphoria, feeling good and feeling bad, all on a false basis. Because when we feel good, that's on a false basis because nothing's happening. We're just fooling ourselves, or we're just allowing ourselves to be fooled by the closed system in the way that a closed system will always fool us if we haven't seen through it. And the same thing for when we're feeling bad. We're feeling bad, we think we ought to be able to progress. We ought to be able to boost ourselves off and head off in the direction of freedom. And then when that doesn't happen, we feel bad because we think, well, I should have been able to do that. It was supposed to work out like that, but it didn't. But that's on a false basis too, because it wasn't supposed to work out like that. There was never a chance in a million, billion years that it would ever work in the first place. It was doomed to failure even before we started it. So there shouldn't be any getting our hopes up and there shouldn't be any being any being disappointed. If we could see things straight. Which gives us a clue as to how we can go from being trapped in this up and down world of excitement, anticipation, uh, demoralization and anxiety, it's not going to work out. How we can get out of this world which is just made up of these types of excitement, positive and negative, euphoric and dysphoric excitement into the real world. And it has something to do with not anticipating that things are getting better, not projecting that on the world. And then that means we won't be disappointed either. To say this isn't to say that to say that we can never get free on purpose isn't to say we're all doomed or something like that. It's just that little um, phrase on purpose. On purpose means by using the mind as a guidance system. And when we say using the mind as a guidance system, we mean using the framework, using the polar framework, which will close reality off for us and create a virtual reality, which is in complete contrast to actual reality, closed rather than open, i.e. it loops back on itself and negates itself the whole time. So how do we know that isn't real? Well, it's advertising the fact that it isn't real by the very fact that it is going around in circles, eating itself or self negating itself the whole way. It's like a paradox that keeps denying itself what, or contradicting itself. What is that paradox telling us? It's telling us that the question itself was nonsensical. So we can actually be free, but just we can't be free on purpose. We can't move in the direction of freedom by design, by a method, by thinking about it, by creating any kind of um, system or methodology. That's not the way to do it. Goals aren't the way to do it. Mental health isn't a goal. 
mental health can't be a goal. Because if it is a goal, then what we're aiming at is the positive pole. And what we're also buying into is a negative pole. So we're buying into circular motion again, which is what, um, which as Philip K. Dick says, circular motion is the deadest form of motion that there is. We might think, oh, there's activity here, there's motion here, I'm getting somewhere. It's the motion of deception. It's a deceptive motion because it's not moving at all. So this gives us a different way of looking about what looking at what we have to do. If we're sincere about wanting to be free, and that's a whole big question in itself because being free is a big thing. It's moving out of the world that I think is real, but isn't real. And it's leaving behind this identity, this finite self that I think is real, but isn't real. And leaving it all behind and stepping out into this vast, mysterious world, mysterious world in which, which I won't recognise at all. It's nothing like the, um, the, the, the little playpen that is created by the, the framework of up and down, yes and no, right and wrong. It's not contained within a framework. It's, it, it, it's the real world, in other words, rather than a, um, a system of references or a system of reference or a system of signs or descriptions. It's the actual genuine territory and it's uncharted. Truth is a pathless land, as Krishnamurti says. So that's another aspect that what we're looking at here is the biggest shock we'll ever, ever have. It's like being born from this kind of bubble of private unreality, which we think is real, into the real world in totally new and unexpected terms. There isn't a bigger shock to the system than that. There couldn't be. The movement from unreality into reality, when we thought unreality was reality, so we weren't expecting to, there to be such a thing as genuine reality. What bigger shock could there be than that? So what that means is on a level, on one level, an unacknowledged level usually, we don't want to be free. As um, all the existential psychotherapists and, so, and, and philosophers have said, we don't want to be free. That's something else being free. That's a lot of um, it's a lot of work, really. It's an awful lot of work. Whereas being in the mind created virtual reality, the closed world, it's not work because we're kind of like on a little train or a little something that keeps moving and we're going with it and we're thinking we're doing it, doing it. I think yes, I am doing this because I want to do it instead of seeing that we're actually just following the tracks that are laid out for us to follow and going along it's kind of an inertial thing following the tracks is not volitional it's inertial but when we're living in the closed world of our thoughts we think that it is volitional and we think that our goal orientated action is perfectly free that we really want to do it rather than it being an actual compulsive um, thing that is a consequence of uh, the polarity consequence of living in a closed world. So when we stretch out for the goal, we're imprisoning ourselves. We think we're doing something to help ourselves, but that's how we imprison ourselves in the contradictory sense that we think we're freeing ourselves, but by clutching for freedom, we are very, very effectively imprisoning ourselves. But leaving aside the question as to whether we actually have the slightest interest in being free, it can be seen that once we do gain an independence from the thinking mind so that we don't have to have it there telling us what to do and telling us what the world is, if we can move away from it just to, so we're not stuck to it, so it isn't a part of us, so it can still be there and we can still use the thinking mind if we want to, but it's not us. We pulled away from it. We can actually see it and say that I am not it even though it will tell me what I am and then I will be it. If I don't buy into that, I will always be not it because what I am can't be described or defined by the thinking mind. Anything that can be described or defined by the thinking mind is just the thinking mind, is just the framework. And who we are is not a framework, who we are is not a system of logic. Even though it's very, very curious that when we are creatures of logic, creatures of the rational mind, slaves of the rational mind, 
then this idea of reality or who we are in our essence as being completely and utterly indefinable and unknowable is something that we will recall, recoil from in horror. So we will recoil in horror from the reality of how things actually are and how we actually are. And we'll head in the direction of um, a private, private bubble of unreality where we can keep spinning around in a sterile kind of a way, feeling quite safe and kidding ourselves that something is happening when it isn't happening. So that's also what um, Eastern metaphysics calls samsara. There seems to be a lot of stuff on offer, but there's nothing on offer at all, really. Just, um, just lo It's just a load of advertising, a load of promotion, promotions going on. And there's, the, the reality itself is com completely sterile, completely barren. As Miller Raper says, we can't even envisage the, barren, envisage the barrenness of samsara. If we thought um, the Gobi Desert was barren, it's nothing compared to samsara. The Gobi Desert's got some bits of stuff, life in it. It's got something going on in it. Samsara hasn't really, because it's the loop. When they talk about the wheel of samsara, that's what they're talking about, the closed world. They're just creating a bias, I think, in mind. So what if we were genuinely interested, and there's nothing to stop us. It's possible that we could be genuinely interested in seeing what's really happening, what's really out there, who we really, you know, who I really am. Am I this creature running around in this zoo, this human zoo, obeying all the social rules, playing all the social games, or am I more than that, something else other than that? So it's possible we could be interested in that. And if we are, then the thing to learn is how to separate ourselves from thought, pull away from it, exist without it, become independent of the thinking mind. <laughs>